Welcome to A Better HR Business, the podcast that looks at how HR consultants and HR tech firms grow their businesses and how they help their employers to get the best out of their people. Remember, for show notes and downloads, go to www.getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. That's getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. Okay, let's get started. Hello, thanks for joining me today. I'm really looking forward to my conversation today with Jeremy Pollock. Jeremy is the CEO and founder of Pollock Peace Building Systems, a fantastic business that helps employers, businesses deal with the very complicated issue of workplace conflict. So Jeremy, thank you very much for joining me today. Thanks for having me on, Ben. Appreciate it. Great to have you here. Yeah. So I want to get to you and Pollock Peace Building in a minute, but firstly, look, we've all seen different forms of workplace conflict, but your company specializes in this area, so I'm sure you've seen it all. What would be the most common and or the most difficult workplace conflict situations that you typically deal with at Pollock Peace Building? Oh, man. So there's so many different types of conflicts, but I do think that there are some themes. You know, one major theme, of course, is a lot of times it comes down to some sort of failure in leadership. If conflict yeah. is allowed to sort of emerge and persist for a long period of time, typically that's a leadership problem. Even if it's between two employees, if leaders don't understand how to help mediate that problem or address it or help solve it, it's because they don't feel like they have the competence to do so, or they don't have the confidence to do so, or they're kind of avoiding confrontation. So, I mean, a lot of times we see conflict avoiding cultures where leaders, some leaders, they have a an addiction to being liked. And so they don't want to ever feel confrontational. So they never hold anyone accountable. They never want to have those conversations. And that tends to lead to conflict. On the other, sort of the other spectrum, then we have leaders who don't know how to communicate well, feel very intimidating and aggressive. And sometimes kind of like it could come across as bullying behavior or something like that. And a lot of times, I mean, I've seen it where there's some bosses that they just don't have like, quote unquote, a soft side. They only have a very direct kind of hard style communication, even though they have good intentions. It's not like they're actually trying to be mean. It's just like their mannerisms, their style, their tone, it just comes across as very intimidating. And if you don't know them very well, or if you work for them and you just know them as your boss, you can start perceiving them as sort of this hostile entity. But like, if I get to know them, it's actually a good person. Yeah. He or she has like, you know, a good heart, he's good intentions. They just don't know how to communicate well enough or soft enough or change their style or adapt their style enough so that it's received in a better way. So those are the two kind of big things I see is like on one hand, the avoidant boss. And then on the other hand, the really sort of aggressive, at least perceived to be aggressive boss. Absolutely. And what about on the team level? What kind of the common or most challenging workplace conflict issues do you see at the team or inter-team level? Yeah. So at the team level, a lot of times, well, so one major thing is about I guess I could bucket it into this idea of like respect or honoring the other. So if someone is stepping on another person's toes, i.e. not staying in their lane, but trying to get involved in someone else's, you know, work, or at least what is perceived to be, this is my lane, you know, stay out of my lane kind of thing. Sometimes you'll see one, let's say a VP step in and give advice or direction or something to a team member of another VP. And that VP is like, well, why are you stepping yeah. in on my toes here in my lane? So there's some level of respect and honoring each other's understanding what the expectations are about who is running what, who's giving directions to who, who's reporting to who. I mean, that's kind of a common thing that I see. Yeah. And then from there, it takes just one kind of instance of conflict that doesn't get resolved. Like, hey, this person one time, you know, I walked in the room and he said hi to everybody, but didn't say hi to me. Like, what was that about? And then that never got resolved, never got talked about. And so forever after that, until it gets talked about, there's this little perception that this person doesn't like me. And that can snowball into all kinds of colors and layers in future interactions. So the other person could be talking, the, the person that walked in the room originally, and basically in a future interaction, just be totally benign, say, hello, how's it going? How was your weekend? That kind of stuff. And somehow it's still perceived as being hostile. A lot of times we see as initial events that aren't resolved aren't processed, aren't talked about, leads to all kinds of conflicts that don't really need to be there. So it's like an initial miscommunication wow. that turns into something. And yeah, it's a complicated area because as you said, you've got opposite ends of the spectrum. You've got the avoidance side of things. We've seen that. And then, you know, the famous 
in your face leader is seen as aggressive. And then probably in between, you've got your passive aggressive stuff and then problems that snowball or accumulate layer upon layer, perhaps. And then the ones I'm thinking of, of course, you've got the interdepartmental things of sales versus marketing, HR versus finance, all those sort of things. Yeah. Why do they get to make the decisions around the budget when we don't and that kind of stuff? Like they, you know, senior leaders care about that department more than us. We never get the respect we want, that kind of stuff. And so that can create all kinds of perceptions between departments too. Brilliant. Now, look, I'm sure there's all sorts of bad advice out there for resolving workplace conflict issues. What are some of the unsuccessful methods that you've seen around the place? Well, I'll circle back to being avoidant. One of the major things people think is going to resolve a conflict is just ignoring it. So if I just don't deal with this, they'll work it out on their own, that sort of thing. Or if I just don't address it, like eventually she'll come around, she'll start thinking of me different if I just don't address it. That almost never works. So being avoidant, it really is important to communicate around conflict and actually yeah. talk about what's going on and try to get someone to understand that I actually do care about what's going on with you. Maybe there was some misinterpretation, et cetera. Let's talk about it. Let's figure it out. So that's one. In terms of, you know, something I see at the organizational level, when leaders are trying to make changes that they think are right, but they haven't done any kind of real assessment or discovery process to figure out what are the actual problems and what are some solutions that we think could work. And then bringing people into the conversation that these kinds of decisions or changes would affect. So I remember worked with a couple of companies now that have tried to implement sort of like this diversity, equity, inclusion type of programs. And they go into it and they start recognizing, number one, whatever process they're implementing, it seems to be stirring things up and creating more problems than there was before. At least that's the perception and or it's not getting the level of engagement that they're wanting. And so my question is, well, did you do some assessment up front? Did you actually ask people in some systematic way, is there an issue here? What are the issues regarding this kind of subject? And they never did anything like that. They never asked anybody, do we actually have a problem? They just thought we should be doing this kind of thing. So let's just do it. And then they realized once they got into it, ah, we're kind of like, we're digging ourselves into a hole here. How do we get back out? Both of them just basically stopped doing it completely, ignored anything they've done so far. And that was really frustrating for people because it's like, oh, well, you started down this path, you had a survey, you asked us questions. Now you're not doing anything about it, or you're not doing anything with the data. Why did you waste our time and this yeah. sort of thing? So it's really important to have a really robust plan in place. If you're going to create some change around conflict, around organizational culture, that you understand, you do some discovery, you understand exactly what the problems are. You bring people in to talk about potential solutions. Then you have a very systematic method of actually addressing those conflicts, implementing the solutions and measuring whether it's working or not and making adjustments down the road if it's not working. It has to be systematic. People have to be brought into the loop, has to be transparent. And when it's not, it can create a lot of problems. Yeah, wow. Well, it's actually really complicated because it's multifaceted. You've got the question of have you dug deep to find the actual root cause of something? And that's yeah. just so important. It's a bit like, I don't know, psychological assessment almost, but what's going on under the surface there? And then having a plan and a process. So in other words, doing things right in a yeah. structured way or a thought out way. And then that also includes follow-up, I guess. And then also the last bit, and probably maybe the most difficult for some people is the to do it right, to actually come across in the right way and the manner in which you speak with yeah. someone. There's a lot to think about. And you kind of got into a little bit about how you would resolve or what's an effective way of resolving some of these workplace conflict challenges. Can you talk to us a bit more about that? And then also are there different approaches or techniques or tools, whether that's training, whatever, different ways of dealing with situations depending on the situation? Well, first things first, everybody has to feel like they have a voice. So you're not going to solve anything if you don't give people space to actually talk. Typically, what we do is we bring people in and do one-on-ones first. We don't bring people into big group talks or mediations or even just a two-person mediation. We don't do any of that until we do one-on-one -on -one interviews and one-on-one -on -one discovery interviews. So try to bring in whoever is involved and get their voice, get their perspective and let them know that they've been heard. And there's some techniques around like reflective listening and being sure that people feel like they're actually being listened to without defending, without rejecting, without you know dismissing what they're saying. Just listen to them. Make sure they know you're listening to them. Maybe you're writing it down, that sort of thing. Sometimes just people getting heard and feeling listened to can resolve a lot of the tension. The next thing then after they feel heard is 
if they're in a space where they actually feel a little calmer, because when people don't get heard, they get very frustrated. They can be very escalated. When people calm down a little bit and they feel like, okay, they're actually listening to me. They care about what's going on with me. They're looking to do something. At that point, you can get into solutions. So I always want to start out with the what I call the care bucket first. Like I actually care. Mm -hmm. I'm going to show you I care. I'm going to listen to you before I jump into solutions. Then I get to solutions. And when I'm creating solutions, it really does have to be, or at least it ought to be, co-creation with the people that are involved. So it's not just me creating, okay, here's what we're going to do, carry it out. It's, mm -hmm. hey, what do you think we should do? Or here's some ideas that I was thinking about. What do you think about this? And really co-creating the solutions with people that are involved so that they feel like they have agency in creating solutions. They have some buy-in. And then you have some accountability around it. Okay, so we've talked about, you know, here's some of the issues you told me about. We talked about some solutions. Here's what we're going to try out. When should we check in on this? You want to check in in two weeks? You want to check in in a month? How do we want to check in? And what are our ways of sort of measuring whether this is working? Is it just asking, hey, are things working? Are things better? Or is there some other sort of more empirical way of asking? So coming up with those kind of three steps, like the listening, the solutions, and the accountability is really important. Now, if I become Oscar the Grouch or, you know, the CFO says, look, this is time and money for either our HR teams or if we use Pollock Peace Building for this sort of support, isn't it just a bunch of people in a room talking about their feelings and then get back to work? You know, this is going to be a waste of our time. Now, before I let you answer that, I'm actually having a little flashback moment to a company workshop I was at in Houston in a hotel and there's a whole bunch of managers talking. And in one of the breaks, there were a couple of guys talking and one was sort of saying he was really proud of the number of people he'd gotten rid of in his career. And his phrase was, I always remember the phrase, you know, I always stomp in their throats till they go. The other guy was talking about how many people he turned around and made really great performers. And I'll bet you mm. anything, if you then follow their careers and the ROI, the return on investment or the performance measures from their respective business units, I know which one's going to have better results. Yeah. And it's not the guys just churning people out in an angry, aggressive sort of way. So back to the question of what's the payback on this or how do you get that business benefit? Yeah. So, I mean, there are some very obvious links between happy employees and the bottom line. And it's just, it's well presented in the data around workplace conflict, certainly around effective leadership, around happy employees, engaged employees, satisfied employees, all kinds of studies around this sort of thing. I mean, you could look at the research, but you could also just make it very anecdotal. And we've dealt with bosses that are reluctant to get into this sort of thing because of that reason. It's like, why can't everybody just suck it up and, you know, kind of get yeah. through it? Like, well, just be professional here, you know, that kind of thing. And if you get into sort of a motivational questioning with someone, because someone like that is like their motivation to engage in a potentially costly, both resource costly and maybe also monetarily costly, their motivation to engage in that sort of thing is low. And so you have to increase motivation. The only way that people are going to engage in a thing that takes effort and money is they're going to be highly motivated. So you could ask someone like, well, what is your goal here? I mean, what is going on now that you think could be improved? Oh, well, we have a lot of turnover or people don't seem to be very happy and there's lots of problems all the time. And then it takes up two hours a day dealing with drama when they should be productive. Like, okay, so you're having productivity loss. You're having loss related to retention because it's going to cost you a bunch of money to replace someone and train a new person. There's all kinds of costs associated. And potentially, you know, if someone really is unhappy and they leave, you know, maybe you get some lawsuits going on. So there's a lot of potential costs that you need to mitigate against in a workplace, especially when there's conflict in the workplace. So are you interested in mitigating that stuff? Are you interested in fixing some of these issues, having better retention? Okay. Yeah, of course I'm interested. I, I want a better line. Okay. Well, let's talk about some potential sort of routes to that. You know, you tell me, what do you think is going to do it? Well, people just have to suck it up. Okay, that's not working, is it? I have another method. We got to get people to feel more engaged or more satisfied or more peaceful, feel like they get cared for. Like, if that were the case, I know it sounds sort of high fluid, but mm -hmm. if that were the case, if that was the method to get you to your goal, to get a better retention, lower turnover, less risk of lawsuits, et cetera, if that was the goal, if that was the method to get to that goal, would you be open to that method? Okay, well, why don't we try it out? Let's try it out and see what happens. Let's give it six months and see if in six months we have higher employee satisfaction, higher engagement, that kind of thing. And we'll see it. Whatever you spent with us over six months, is it worth what you saved in productivity loss, in drama, in turnover, et cetera? We'll see. Let's measure it out. Absolutely. Yeah. And then 
the example you hear around the place of workplace culture, it's what people do when the boss is not there, that kind of thing. It's where people go above and beyond, or if they see a breakdown in process, or we could do things better, they're more likely to take action and make improvements, suggest change, et cetera, if the right environment is there and they're being heard, as you mentioned earlier. Now, I'm sure there are all yeah. sorts of different ways of resolving workplace conflict. We kind of talked about the initial stages of assessments and one-to-one -one conversations and stuff like that. Can you tell us a little bit about Pollock Peace Building? What does your company do and then how do you do it and who do you help? Yeah, you know, we work in all kinds of industries. We see a lot of work in government, healthcare, education, technology, a lot of real estate and attorneys now. So we've worked in probably about 70 different industries, something like that. We've worked with like small mom and pop, you know, three person businesses up to, you know, Fortune 500 companies, large consulting, global consulting firms. So yeah, we work all across the board and we do a number of different things, but really our sort of main buckets are conflict interventions and training, so which is more proactive. So on the intervention side, we have a program called Peacemaking, which is for people that are actually in active conflict with each other. It's a combination of coaching, training, and mediation and sort of facilitated dialogue. So that's our peacemaking program. We have coaching programs where we work one-on-one -on -one with individuals or sometimes with groups. And then we have our training aspect. So that's more proactive. It's more preventative. Companies come to us when they're saying, you know, hey, we've got a whole customer service team here that's dealing with a lot of issues, you know, or a whole community management team in our residential properties and they're dealing with a bunch of residents and there's escalated situations and we want to make sure they have the tools to de-escalate those situations. We want to make sure they have the tools to resolve workplace conflict or give each other effective feedback, give feedback effectively without getting offensive. All those kinds of different types of tools and techniques and we have different trainings on. So we have the sort of the reactionary, like we come in and intervene and then we also have the preventative and proactive approach. Brilliant. And so that preventative or proactive approach that then feeds on and can create cultural or workplace cultural change beyond That's the, the idea. There's a fire. We need to put the fire out. Now, how do we yeah. make things better? Exactly. We do sort of like one-off robust trainings with different topics. We also have a training academy called the Peaceful Leaders Academy. And that's all for, mostly for leadership. We also have a program for team members, but we have a robust, it's like a six month training program. They come in, it's all virtual. They do asynchronous training combined with live group coaching ongoing for about six months. And we teach them all kinds of skills, all the skills that we have seen that when we come into conflicts and we see ineffective leadership is the reason for the conflict. It's these particular skills that they don't have. And so we started creating a whole academy around training leaders in those types of skills so that they can create peaceful, productive cultures on an ongoing basis. That's brilliant. So if a company either has issues or they would like to get better and create that better culture, they can send members of their team along. Exactly. To that academy. Right. Okay. Yeah. We offer a certification. It's called a certified peaceful leader through that academy. And then we also have like a large subscription model for their entire company. So if they want team members, just anybody from the lowest you know, sort of level employees up to middle management, we have a sort of large blanket team member model as well so that anybody can have access to some of the training. That's not a certification program, but it's just access to a lot of the different workshops online and group coaching and all that stuff. Whereas the certification is our more robust, intense sort of leadership development training program. Yeah, very good. Now I've seen on the website itself, you've got a lot of excellent free information, educational resources and so on. So can you tell people what they might go and check out on the website? Oh, sure. Yeah. So on our main website, pollockpeacebuilding.com, there's a free 12-step mediation guide. It's called the Coworker Mediation Guide. So it's 12 steps in how to do a mediation between two coworkers if you're a leader in some ways. And then on our Peaceful Leaders Academy, we have a free ebook, which is five tips to creating a healthy workplace culture through the lens of peaceful leadership. So those are the two kind of good resources to grab if you go to either one of those sites, peacefulleadersacademy.com. Very good. And also there's the blog there. I've seen some great articles, some great information there. So yeah, you've covered a lot of ground and it's such an important area, societal change and arguments and so on. But at the workplace, we spend so much time there. It's so important to get things right and to have a nice environment. And then it does help create those business results that we're looking for. If people want to learn more about Pollock Peace Building or they want to work with you, what should they do next? Yeah, if they come to pollockpeacebuilding.com or they come to peacefulleadersacademy.com, they can check out those websites. But really, you know, you can book a free call with us. We do free consultations or discovery calls to learn about what's going on, what your needs are, if you have a conflict going on, or if you want to prevent conflicts from happening and you want to create peaceful cultures 
best thing is to do is schedule a call with us and we'll see if we can help. Very good. Excellent. If you're listening to this on the go, check out the show notes for the website. But otherwise, again, it's pollockpeacebuilding.com is the main site. And yeah, Jeremy, I want to thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Ben. Appreciate it. Thanks for joining us today on A Better HR Business, the podcast that explores the world of HR consulting and HR tech businesses. For show notes and downloads, go to www.getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. That's getmorehrclients.com forward slash podcast. Remember to subscribe and share the show with any friends who are busy growing a HR business. Thanks and see you next time.